All right, so a new version of React.js is coming. It's coming very soon. And this one is gonna be a big release because this time React is making some noticeable changes in how React works. And one of the changes which I am excited to learn more about is the compiler architecture in a way of React. So we're gonna go through this blog post, but I wanted to tell you a few things about React in general. One thing is that React is a library itself, right? So the code you write in React React is not able to see it upfront as a developer, right? So React has never been a compiler. If you take a look at Svelte, for example, Svelte itself is a compiler. So it can see the code you have written in Svelte and it can, you know, do some modifications here and there, take bits of a few things. It has to be careful, otherwise it can break your thing. But just like you have compilers in C and C++, which can optimize your code in a way when you pass certain flags and they can aggressively optimize as well, React would never be able to do so without a compiler in its in its runtime in a way like not exactly runtime but before you actually you know crunch the code and do all sorts of things with it but this update includes some information on that so let's go ahead and try to figure out what's going on this blog post by react react labs what have been working on in February 2024, let's take a look at what's going on. So of course the blog post starts with one of the biggest things, which is the React compiler. React compiler is no longer a research project. The compiler now powers Instagram.com in production and are, and we are working to ship the compiler across additional stuff surfaces at Meta and prepare the first open source release. See, this is one of the best things I like about React and because it's built by Facebook. Before you release the software to consumers, like in this case, consumers are us, the developers, you get to test and iron out a lot of things on production level software, like Instagram, Facebook, Meta, different softwares. And this is like, this is an amazing way to build a very polished product without actually, you know, making a formal release and then getting, you know, edge case bugs and things because anything that can and will go wrong in a way in production would happen anyway on Instagram, right? So, I mean, your website is not beating Instagram web traffic anytime soon, right? Until and unless you are Google, for example. So this is this is this is something I really like about React in general and open source in general, which are backed by big companies, is that they get to try things on their own products. So as discussed in our previous post, let's see what this one is. Uh, this one is a post from last year, from March 20. 2023. Yeah, this is this is React Forget is the video I did I think a couple of years back. So this is something they told last year also like we are working on a few things but like they said in the previous post react can sometimes re-render too much when the state changes so the obvious example of this is for example let's say you are doing a heavy computation within the react component right before just before render cycle and let me give you a real world example let me actually tell you that it really happens so it, it's not as heavy as you would probably think it is but i i just wanted to give you a quick example let's say that we want to determine the icon associated with this particular course item right now whenever i'm opening and closing this panel it's re-rendering this component is re-rendering but this icon let's say is a heavy computation to determine because it has to traverse the full course item list and it has to check the type of that particular item and then it has to get an icon from you know from some other place so in general like when you have something like this which you want to do on render time and you want this computation to happen what can happen is that react can render but it can also just memoize it in a way it would be great if just react remembers that this is you know the icon associated with this title is this and you as a developer can do it it's just that you have to use hooks like use memo and use callback and these memo apis so it says that manual memoization is a compromise it clutters up our code is easy to get wrong and requires extra work to keep up to date and that is true because a lot of times it might seem like memoization will give you a performance boost but in most cases it actually does not also right so because memoization itself could take a, a while compared to you know you just computing the fresh data every time so it's not a silver bullet but it's still for the most cases when you are doing like a O n square O n cube lookup just before the render cycle and the data set is large memoization is a must have right so another example of this is for example let's say you are on a code dump playground and you are let's say starting up with a bun playground why not so the sidebar which you get which is like a vs code sort of thing the sidebar which you get when you create and remove folders and files for example when i open this node modules folder and i open let's say bun types or this underscore at the rate types thing this 
every time I'm toggling and opening and closing a folder, this is triggering a state update, right? Now, this is not built in React as per se, but just to give you an idea that if anything, any sort of computation, if you're doing over here, which is slightly expensive also. And if you forgot to memoize it, it'll be like a huge thing, right? Because this is a component which can like easily render multiple times a second also, like given that how active you are. Our vision is for React to automatically re-render just the right parts of UI when the state changes without compromising on React's core mental model. This is, I think this is a big part because uh, what they don't want is for you to write use memo and use callback all the way across your code base. That's why they had to create a compiler. We believe that React's approach is UI as simple function of state with standard JavaScript values and items is a key part of why React has been approachable for so many developers. This is also true. This is also something I said, I think in one of the videos where um, when you're learning about Vue or Svelte, you usually end up in syntax, which is very specific to that particular language. But with React, it's JavaScript all the way. It's just JSX. JSX is independent from React, by the way, you can use JSX without React also. But yeah, React is JavaScript apart from, you know, a few things like hooks and all but that also is like javascript construct there is no magic as per se there are no custom attributes that trigger specific react behavior and so on compared to like Swelt or compared to vue.js for example so they say that javascript is a notoriously challenging language to optimize and thanks to its loose rules and dynamic nature the react compiler is able to compile code safely by modeling the rules of javascript and the rules of react for example, React components must be idempotent, returning the same values given the same inputs, and can't mutate props or state values. These rules limit what developers can do and help us carve out a safe space for compiler to optimize. Of course, we understand that developers sometimes bend the rules a little bit, and our goal is to make React compiler word work out of the box as much as possible. The compiler attempts to detect when the code doesn't strictly follow React rules and will either compile the code where safe or skip compilation if it isn't safe. So I'm assuming that you can like technically opt out of react compilation thing as well if required and of course they are testing against meta's large and varied course code base in order to help validate this approach which i think is like a great way but i think in this way also like you know i, I mean like thousands of developers are writing code on meta's code base so there would be <laughs> if there would be hacks and things around i'm sure at meta's code base also but i think releasing it to community would reveal a few edge cases which are like extremely bad coding practices gone wrong when compiler tries to optimize it in the wrong way so um yeah for developers who are curious about making sure their code follows react rules we recommend enabling strict mode and configuring react's eslint plugins like this is this is like super important stuff when you are working with react um, in development and production, like production doesn't require strict mode, but in development, you should do it because development can catch bugs that production will, you know, just the, your production code will blow up on that. To see the compiler in action, you can check out our talk from last fall. So uh, that's basically it. That's all about React compiler. This blog post gets into no details or no specific stuff as such or examples as such. So looking forward to trying it out and seeing like what the output code is like, how it behaves, how performant it is, any sort of benchmark. So, so we'll wait for that. The next thing is actions. Now this is something which has been like, you know, slightly controversial also in a way where people have almost like two opinions, two drastically different opinions. The first one is that this is great. And the second one is that this sucks and you are going back to, uh, you know, you, you said that PHP was bad, but this is exactly PHP and this is more a lot of magic convolution and so on. So let me know in the comments below, which category do you fall in? Me personally, I'm a little neutral on this stand. I, I take a neutral stance on this one because on one hand, while I agree, this is like, you know, a great way to abstract away complexity of creating an API endpoint. On the other hand, it is magic, right? So there is no denying in that, that it is magic. And at some point you are like just hiding away one of the very important things is that how does front end communicate with back end, which is good and bad both, like depending on what your argument is. That is what is known as actions in React. And this actions is basically nothing but a function that gets executed on the server, even though you write it just like you know, a normal React.js code. But if you do form action and then search, this search function 
can execute on server. That means you can use some sort of secrets, DB calls, some API secrets, which you don't want to be visible on client and so on. It'll just work out of the box. So the action function can operate synchronously or asynchronously. You can define them on the client side using standard JavaScript or on the server with the use server directive. When using an action, React will manage the life cycle of the data submission for you, providing hooks like use form status and use form state to access the current state and response of the form action, right? So basically this is, this is the thing that helps you almost like, you know, not handle the API sort of things by yourself. So you would just write code like this. You would define a search function. You would write that this function executes on server with use server directive. And then you can use these hooks to get value, to get the status of like what's happening on the server side and on the client side. Alongside actions, we are also introducing a feature named use optimistic. So this is optimistic UI. This just means that, you know, if you're just closing a button or, you know, if you're just closing a screen or clicking save on a dialog box, you can just do the action which the user is expecting to do without waiting for the server round trip call. Because in most cases, it will succeed, right? In case it doesn't succeed, you can always fall back to, you know, an error screen or something. Like you can reverse the change you made and you can fall back to the error screen. This provides a very clean and very neat user experience. So I'm gonna give you a quick example for this as well. For example, take a look at this UI for building a course on CodeDAM, right? So when I click on this button, you see that it immediately turns into, you know, convert to draft. When I click on that, it immediately turns into publish item. When I click on this, it immediately con turns into convert to draft as well. But there has to be a backend call which is made, right? It can't be this fast. So this is what is sort of optimistic UI or optimistic rendering is in a way. And when it fails, you can just always revert the state back and show an error screen, you know, like something went wrong with the network request, please try again later, whatever. But in most cases, you know, this would succeed. So you can have like a, a nice app, app like experience where you can just click on buttons and you know it'll just keep on it'll just work very fast and very nicely so this is what optimistic ui in a way means that you do the thing ahead of time before worrying about like what the service is and if it is an error you just fall back to the last known state and show an error message and so on so these are a few things they are introducing as well so a lot of these things for example the use server use client directives next.js already uses because it has opted into react canary so if you know react canaries it includes a lot of features in React 19, which will be there by the way, right? So frameworks like Next.js just pin their version to React Canary and they release stable releases. So Next 14 is there, but React 19 is not there, which includes these things, right? So for example, use client and use server are bundler features designed for full stack React frameworks. They mark the split point between two environments. Use client instructs the bundler to generate a script tag, while use server tells the bundler to generate a post endpoint. So this is, this is the API abstraction and and this is the you know your regular client side component together they let you write usable components that compose client side interactivity with related server side logic they have also added support for document metadata which is like um, you know having titles and meta descriptions and og tags and everything which you by the way could still do in react normally but it's just nice to have a native support for that it just makes it slightly easier since all of these features work together it's difficult to release them in the stable channel individually releasing actions without complementary hooks for accessing the form states would limit the practical usability of actions that is actually true like if you're creating an endpoint where you can submit data you also have to have those hooks for use form status form state so it has been two years of iteration and now react canary is now ready to be shipped to react latest the new features mentioned above are compatible with any environment your app runs in providing everything needed for production use because they are saying because asset loading and document metadata may be a breaking change for some apps the mix the next version of react will be a major version react 19 so react 19 is coming so that's basically it about this blog post majorly and i am assuming that they will be releasing react 19 in react conf which is supposed to be in mid of may so excited for that to happen and excited for those things to get merged into react stable channel that's all for this one let me know in the comments below what do you think about this new react version are you excited or are you frightened again with react there would be a couple of new things to learn but i don't think like given a little bit of effort a little bit of time from your side you should be up and running in no time it's mostly the same stuff with react 18 but with a few new added compatibility added features not even like nothing is changing as such just a few features are getting added. So that's all for this one. I'm going to see you in the next video very soon.